Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite our keynote address. Good afternoon, viewers, and a very warm welcome to our president, Mr. B. Suresh. Uh, I'm extremely delighted to be here uh, because the topic of today's session, vertical transportation, is very, very close to my heart. Before I begin with my brief uh, opening remark, I would like to sincerely compliment the entire team of Focus, the Apex management team, the governing council, the founding members, for a brilliant efforts, those have been engaged. Focus is just six to eight months young, but there are lots of proud accomplishments Focus already has. Uh, 130 plus members, we have the chairperson and the co-chairperson at the national level for each and every important discipline, which includes architecture, structure, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, firefighting, facility management, vertical transportations, and so on. The vision document from each of these disciplines is also ready. And now this is into an action mode. I personally feel very honored and privileged to be a part of this team, which is for a very noble initiative. Four very purposeful webinars were already conducted and which were very well received. The Bangalore chapter is already in place. Mumbai chapter is already in place. And very soon the Chennai chapter will come. So the aim is to see that focus reaches into all the tier one and tier two cities by the end of this year. And this is one of the very important subject which was not really addressed in earlier times. Critical utility services are very, very important. There have been several forums who are looking after a very, very noble cause of each discipline's performance and excellences. But looking it in a holistic manner, looking it in a together manner is very important. The video which was shown itself spoke about it, the vision and the mission statement. I'm also very happy here to be with three eminent panelists. TAC, of course, uh, uh, he's a legend of a uh, elevator industry. Uh, I think he sleeps, he wakes up, he breathes, everything is about the vertical transportation. We have Mr. Vincent Lobo, Vincent Pinto here from Schindler, and of course, Ashish Ji, uh, he's here with us, and we are going to listen to them. I'm very excited to listen to all of them. From architect lenses, I feel the vertical transportation is one of the very, very well thought industry. As an architect, it's not only me, but all of us are very happy because this particular industry has always been ahead of the time. All our dreams as a designer may be a high density, high rise, catered communities. It wouldn't have been possible without a proper integration of a vertical transportation. And it's not only following its function, it is following its function, it is following its elegance, it's following its safety, it is following its innovation. You name the thing, this industry is absolutely striving to give the best. And that's absolutely a delight for an architect. Uh, I'm just going to share with you a very, very brief presentation, uh, which would kind of give you an idea. Of course, I know there are a lot of learned participants who are here, but how the vertical transportation plays a very big role in architecture. We say architecture is a creative science that combines art and engineering, where both the facets are equally important. It's a collaborative, a cohesive response to create a built environment. Architecture is not only a built form, but it's a built environment, which is responsible for its functionality, contextuality, sustainability, and its behavior. It influences the lifestyle and vertical transportation plays a very vital role in a modern times. So just allow me to share my presentation. I'm, I, I'm aware that there are a lot of uh, knowledge worthy sessions that we have down the line, but this is from architect lenses. You can see these high rise, super high rise structures, Shanghai Tower, City of Financial Center, Taipei 101, Landmark Tower. This wouldn't have been possible without a proper integration of vertical transportation. Each and every of these complexes have more than 10,000 people visiting every day. And this has to work 365 days, 24 by seven. So you can understand the criticality of the lifeline of these all vertical high rise, high density buildings, which is fully dependent in my opinion on a, on a vertical transportation. There's a fun fact there below. 
a cable hoisted elevator can travel up to a maximum altitude of 1700 feet. If you could see some of the very innovative things, uh, this is elevator as a delight. This is a Gonzao City F Center, which is in Gonzao, a Hitachi building system has 530 meter high skyscraper. First floor to 95th floor, can you imagine? It takes you in 42 seconds. The maximum speed is one to six zero minute, minute per uh, minute. Uh, so this is something which is absolutely, absolutely astonishing. This wouldn't have been possible for this particular building to function every day without having the vertical transformation in place. So you can see the kind of innovation that is coming. And this is something that we love as an architect that this industry is always ahead of the time. Anything and everything that we dream about, that dream comes true with a good engineering in place. We talk about the controlling of the load weighing capacity, regulation in the number of trips and dose cycles needed in rush hours, reducing the waiting time, analyzing and working according to the traffic trends and building. You know, the first elevator that had a manual user control was installed in New York Marriott. That's also a fun fact, which is given below. Uh, Tyson Group has come up with a very innovative approach where it's not only the vertical transportation, it's also a horizontal transportation. This multi Tyson Group elevators are used visibly for mega high rise building. It uses very little shop space. It increases the usable area of the building by up to 25%. So this is also a very innovative thought because when you have a large complexes, you also need to take care of a horizontal transmission. It's not only the vertical transportation. So all of these together builds that kind of an efficiency and connectivity into this premises. Of course, Schindler here today and Ashish ji is going to speak on this subject. Schindler ahead uses an IO2 technology which connects the passengers, service technicians, customers, and equivalent technicians in real time. Schindler Ahead is a revolutionary digital system that is a closed loop maintenance, monitoring, interaction, and information system for the elevators and escalators. Schindler Ahead integrates easily with the existing Schindler lifts, and they are also possible for the already built infrastructure. This is something which is a need of today because every second is important for the people when they are coming for their offices. And equally, it is important when they are into a high rise, high density, gated residential communities. So this manages the complete transit of a person when he walks into a compound and when he reaches to his particular work, work, workstation. Otis came up with a double decker lift and the Otis's uh, double decker lift is in Korea, uh, which runs more than 450 meter. It carries 54 passengers at one time, one, uh, in one minute using a single hoist way. This also takes care of seismic sensors and detect the potential earthquake for the building movement from a strong wind. You know, this is a very intelligent science where you can also program your odd and even floors in a rush hours. That actually cuts the number of stops and reduces the waiting time of the passenger because in a premium real estate space like city of New York, Hong Kong, Mumbai, every square foot is important. And the developers and architects, they do really struggle to give more space in the core because that hampers the efficiency of the usable space when it is related with the core. So double decker is one of the very uh, innovative approach and it's, it's working perfectly fine. This gives you a uh, green elevators as we move ahead. It's very important that uh, elevators do not only perform well, they also are having a good response to our sustainability. So several attempts have been made where we have a machine room less technology, we have a gear less, traction design, drive systems to recover the regenerated energy, precision traffic control, computerized system to reduce the light load trips and so on. So this actually gives you an opportunity not only to consume the energy, but also to generate the energy. You know, So that is something which is, again, in my opinion, very innovative, whereby we are not only thinking of how to we use the lips with the consumption of energy, but we also regenerate the energy. Uh, the fun fact is the first simple elevator was invented by a mathematician, Archimedes, in third century before Christ Greece. Uh, this talks about, again, a green aspects of the elevator, the drive systems, which regenerate the energy. And if it is used appropriately, it can save up to 30% of the energy. Uh, I think that is also quite brilliant uh, because you have an opportunity when you're going up and you're coming down, there's a particular energy that is created due to the velocity that is captured and it is used as a medium to give it back to the grid. This talks about safety, one of the very important aspects because 
uh, as you are quite dependent on elevator to go up and down, similarly on your escalator to go up and down. So there is an introduction of a ARD, which is automatic rescue device, which kind of makes you absolutely safe in case of anything going wrong, the power failure, the lift has the automatic rescue device, which will ensure that it comes to the immediate next stop and the door opens automatically. So this also ensures that the eventuality has been very well captured. Safety is not compromised. That's also one of the great facets that we as an architect admire and appreciate. Uh, hygiene in the elevators, typically in a post-pandemic solutions, uh, it is very important that you have to have the hygiene inside the elevator, which is quite non-infectious, quite good. So it's very important that your buttons are very clean. And this is also a very important aspect that all of these heavy elevators, they go up and down with a simple feather touch to a button. So there's also a lot of customer delight. All of these elevators are quite flexible in their design strategy. Uh, architect or interior designer can develop uh, inside the cabin design as per their choice, which can promote a uh, low VOC, zero VOC materials and also uh, non-infectious sanitized materials. So these are the modern requirements and I'm sure all the technocrats here are working on it. This talks about touchless elevators, which is a destination control system, a compass system is what OTS people call it. So this also ensures that it is an unmanned lift. You are not depending on any uh, navigation through the buttons inside the lift. It works with the technology, it identifies the person who intends to enter into an elevator and automatically allots you a most best possible elevator to go in a minimum possible time. It also ensures that the wait time is not above certain indices that has already been identified. Uh, the technology is working on automatically disinfect when it's empty. And I think that lot needs to be done. There could be a UEC light harness to power the sun and disinfect by disrupting the molecular bonds. So this is something that I believe is under uh, research and analysis and will very soon uh, the elevators, which will be absolutely compatible to the post-pandemic situation. The escalator handrails are uh, UV sterilized because people, when they walk on an escalator, they always tend to uh, touch the railing of the escalator. So these are some post-pandemic things. And this particular case study absolutely overwhelms me. This is a story of a, a mall, which is called a landmark mall in Hong Kong. Uh, in a very busy city of uh, Hong Kong in a Kowloon area, uh, there was a land parcel which a developer wanted to develop for the mixed use complex for a hotel, hospitality and the commercial tower. And he wanted to accommodate all the shopkeepers who were on the street. So all the shopkeepers who were occupying the space on a street had to be accommodated in one single building. That translated that building to be nine story. Every shopkeeper resisted and they said, no, we are not going to go in a nine story building because our business potential will subsequent, uh, substantially come down. But this particular master escalator, the express escalator is playing its wonder and it ensures that every shop front is visible and it takes a huge amount of a footfall into each and every corner of the mall. So I think this is where an art and engineering can come together and give an absolutely stunning uh, experience. Today, all the shopkeepers are happy their asset value has gone up by at least 5x than what they would have had being on the road. So this is a very small and a brief opening remark from me. And in tax word, I feel uh, vertical transportation is a lifeline. Uh, with this, I would now hand over the dais back to Dominic and would request him to invite for our first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandeep. Wonderful insight. and. It, it was more uh, a technical, uh, you know, uh, insight that we have given on elevator. And uh, we have um, one second, I'm going to share a video of our sponsor, Schindler.
So he is the face of Elevator in India. So I straight away invite our uh, key, our uh, speaker, Mr. Tack Matthew, to take over from here. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are joined from uh, around the world. Good afternoon. Um, my session is on fundamentals of elevator traffic analysis, and I was just uh, talking to Dominic during uh, before the session started that I probably have been talking about this subject for the last uh, 12 to 15 years. And uh, for those of you who have attended, you will find that some of the slides are repetitions. And then the question comes up, why are you repeating it? Uh, the reason why I'm repeating it is because we do still have a problem and I mean, I'll sort of take you through it and we will, uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate why it is that we need to keep talking about it more often. Uh, we have had tall buildings, uh, ambitions. I mean, in India, we have had uh, the Kutta Minar. Uh, we had a building next to Kutta Minar also, which was expected to be uh, even taller, I think some 140 uh, meters tall. Uh, so it's not been that tall has been something which has been uh, uh, alien to us. It's been something that has existed. However, something that always fascinates me is uh, a reference which you find in the Bible and many other uh, books is the Tower of Babel. And they said, uh, it says that, let, go, let us build us a tower that goes up all the way to the heavens. Uh, I mean, that, I mean, you need to recognize this was during uh, uh, prehistoric times when people didn't know what exactly distances were all about. And uh, I mean, again, uh, like I said, this uh, is interesting fact because you know when you look at it, uh, there's a book which I read and uh, the estimate is that this tower could probably have been about two kilometers uh, tall. Uh, and two kilometers tall is, is like a long, tall building. And when you compare it to what we have, uh, the Kingdom Tower is uh, 3,284 feet, which is not even half the height that that tower had been uh, visualized at. And uh, the Sky Mile Tower is still does not top uh, what uh, the Tower of Babel had uh, visualized and what they had in mind or what it, they could have constructed at that time. So then the question that I always ask, and I've been asking this question for the last 15 years, what is the big deal in tall? Um, again, Wikipedia, if you look at it, it says that buildings over six floors were not, were rare because people could not climb uh, stairs. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, you know, climbing up, up and down is something which is not, uh, not practical. All that changed in 1853 when Elisha Greaves Otis demonstrated the safety elevator. Like uh, uh, architect Sandeep mentioned, uh, Archimedes did invent the first elevator, but then there was a little bit of an issue in terms of its safety because in case the rope or the suspension media broke, the elevator would crash, come crashing down. And for all practical purposes, it was left only for transportation of goods. And uh, Elisha Graves uh, demonstrated the safety elevator and in many ways, his original safety design still continues. And his demonstration was he would cut the ropes off and say, all safe, uh, gentlemen. Uh, however, the reality is that even today, though the vertical transport system is what makes the, the, a tall building possible, uh, uh, even a toilet finds higher priority. Now, I say this uh, not as in a sarcastic note, but because I have sat through design meetings where I see this happening uh, often. Now. I mean, I do have uh, uh, exclusions, exceptions. Like for instance, uh, just last week, uh, architect Sandeep Shikri and me we were virtually uh, fighting with a client who wanted to reduce the number of elevators. And both of us took a stand saying, no, uh, we need to have these many elevators to ensure that the building is uh, uh, sustainable and can survive. I, I do also have some uh, clients of mine who are on this panel who uh, I tell them eight elevators, they will invariably go and provide 10 elevators because they understand uh, the requirements. They understand the criticality of elevators. But that is more an exception than the rule. Uh, before this uh, pandemic and the lockdown happened, uh, I, I was part of a, of a panel discussion. And one of the questions that, as the, <clears throat> as the moderator, I threw to the uh, audience was, what percentage of buildings in India would have a design basis for the elevators? And uh, despite uh, the fact that the most uh, optimistic thing was 50%, the general consensus was 85 to 90% of the buildings do not have a design brief. And let me mind you, we were talking about tall buildings. We were not talking about all buildings. We were talking about tall buildings. And uh, the conclusion was that 80% to 90% do not have a traffic analysis or a design basis for the elevators. 
So there is a general apathy towards elevatoring all across. Uh, again, let me say uh, there are exceptions, uh, but then exceptions do not uh, prove uh, the rule, are not going against it. Now, what are the consequences of this? These are reported fatalities. This is not a creation. This is not exaggeration. These are reported fatal fatalities that you will find in the newspapers in India over the last four years. 2018, 12, 2019, 31, which was a horrible year. 2020, despite the lockdown, we had 21. 2021, till date, we already have 10. Now, we all know that these are uh, uh, reported. There could be a lot of unreported fatalities, and it's anybody's guess as to why this uh, happens. So why does this happen? Uh, like I said, uh, elevators and escalators is a low priority. Often it is something which is an afterthought fixed into the building. Yes, we need to put an elevator, so let us put in an elevator. And there's a compromise across all sections. It is designed at the design stage, at the procurement stage, at the execution, maintenance, repair, uh, statutory oversight. Many of the states don't even have a statutory authority for elevators. You can virtually get away with murder uh, in those states because there's nobody to control the elevators. Uh, awareness levels among users is also low. Awareness levels among buyers is also low. Now, as a result of which, we have a lot of unsafe acts and unsafe conditions which lead to uh, fatalities. <clears throat> so when I made this statement, there was this uh, thing which came up saying, oh, how does design uh, lead to a fatality? So let me just put that out. So if you have a building which is uh, uh, badly elevated, which means that the average waiting times are more, the consequences are that the lifts are going to be overloaded, it's going to be overused, there's going to be reduced life of components, and worse, that you do not give shutdown for maintenance. Uh, I have been to a building where... Uh, we were asked to audit the equipment and I went in and I had to request, suggest that all the elevators be shut down because they were in a very bad shape. And I called the, the managing director of that elevator company and asked them, what are you doing? Uh, then the mechanic uh, came across to me and said, sir, the only time I get a shutdown for maintenance is when there is a breakdown. And at that point of time, also the, the facility manager, facility engineer is on his shoulder saying, get the elevator running. So it is breakdown maintenance and no preventive maintenance. So obviously, this will lead into a situation where we have a problem. Then let's, let's look at it uh, from a perspective of the design angle. Uh, the National Building Code of 2016, in terms of the fire and life safety, talks about a protected lobby. Now, this is not something which is new in an international case. CTBH has been recommending this from uh, probably 2008. Now, the consequences of this is what I have, you see in red are people who have burned to death in an elevator on account of the fact that the elevator was not in a protected lobby. Of course, we can argue that you should not use elevators in a fire, et cetera, et cetera. But 2009, Tarangan, it was six firemen who died in an elevator. The railway building 2021, it is nine firemen, nine engineers who died, people who knew what a fire lift was. But unfortunately, without a protected lobby, they really had no uh, learning. And the question that I ask is, are we learning? I have been talking about this from 2009, 2010. I've been talking about this matter. But still today, we have buildings which are coming up where the lobby for the firemen lift is not uh, protected. Uh, instead, we do things like pressurizing of the hoist tray, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to recognize the consequences of what we do has serious issues. The consequences are something that uh, could lead to a fatality. Okay, now let's look at it from cost. Okay, fatality. In fact, when I did mention it uh, about fatality, and they said no, no, but you know, something, things like that can uh, can happen. Just look at it from a cost perspective. This is I've taken a very conservative figure of five hundred rupees per hour. Look at the cost per annum that is lost just in the morning upkeep. In reality, possibly the cost that you'll be incurring will be much more because during the lunchtime, this average waiting times could double or even triple. Uh, and uh, keep in mind, when I say 500 rupees is conservative, you need to remember that many of these buildings are buildings that house Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 uh, companies. Now, we are talking about 300 seconds average waiting time, 1,500 seconds average waiting time. In contrast, the National Building Code says a premium building should have an average waiting time of less than 25 seconds, and a regular building should have 25 to 35 seconds. Where is 25 to 35 seconds? Where is 1,500 seconds? Now, interestingly, this uh, uh, two of these buildings, uh, almost every six months to a year, we are called in asking for help to see whether something can be fixed. And trust me, we have put in a lot of time and effort to figure out what can possibly be done. And every time we come to the, only, the conclusion that the only possible alternative is to bring the building down. 
because you cannot add hoist waste, you cannot increase the pit depth, you cannot bring, increase the hoist waste size, you cannot increase the overhead, then what do you do? And so though I talk about three crores and four crores as being your annual thing, the, the, the expense involved in correcting it is uh, much higher. So that is uh, where I, I sort of set out a, a foundation for why we need to be looking at this with more uh, seriousness. So a word of caution to start off with, uh, just because you go through this uh, session, it is not necessarily going to make you an expert. And I'm quoting uh, Gina Bani, who in many ways is, uh, uh, is a lady who has virtually dedicated her life to uh, traffic analysis of elevators. And uh, the book you have over here is, if anybody does want to get into traffic analysis and does want to get into designing, my suggestion is please buy this book and master that book before you get into understanding what it is. And once you have mastered this book, please go into sites and see how theory and practical uh, situation works. Uh, and I'm repeating it again. This session will not make you an expert. The idea is that you get an I, you get an hint, you get a direction in terms of what needs to be done and what should not be done. So let's start with the traffic analysis components. Uh, uh, those of you who have been involved with uh, elevators or who have had uh, reviewed design, you'll heard of two things, handling capacity and interval. This is what gets uh, touted around a lot. and forms the basis for uh, your uh, elevator design. And in fact, if you want to, if you want to compare two buildings or you want to do a, a, a review of a building, these are the two fundamental aspects from which you start with. First is handling capacity, which is also referred to as quantity of service. Uh, very simply put across, it is what the whole system can handle in a total, in a five minute uh, period. It's expressed as a percentage of the total assumed uh, population. Uh, and then quality of service is a time difference between uh, two elevator departures. Uh, I will clarify what this means in uh, further detail as we uh, go along. Uh, both are derived from the round trip time of a single elevator. Again, I'll get into the formulae uh, that are involved. Uh, do not get uh, scared by the formula. It is, this took a little complicated, but the intention is not that you memorize the formula, but understand the key aspects of what get uh, impact your elevator adequacy or elevator effectiveness. So round trip time, uh, it's a lot of uh, lot of alphabets, uh, RTT round trip time, 2H, 2H. We'll go through each one of this. And again, I'm saying, do not try to memorize it, but understand the, 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 the components that go into making a difference. So we have, uh, there is an H over here. There is an S over here. There's a P over here. We will, we will address that first. So H is the average highest reversal flow. So if uh, you're, you're traveling in a building, uh, it's going to, so suppose the building is uh, uh, 30 floors and it, average floor to floor height is uh, four meters, 120. And so suppose you say that every time the elevator will, as an average, will go to the 25th floor. So the traveling distance that will be involved would be 25 into, uh, into four meters, that is 100 meters. S is the average uh, number of stops. Uh, again, if, if it's a, if a 30 story uh, building uh, and the average number of stops because it's a, uh, I mean, a 20 passenger elevator is 15, so you have 15 possible uh, stops. And P is the average passengers carried, which is 80% of the rated load. Now, uh, keep this in mind, 80% uh, of uh, rated load. So if you see a 20 passenger elevator, when we do the calculation, we are assuming only 80% of the rated load. Uh, multiple reasons for it. One is uh, when we take uh, average passenger loading, we take it as 68 kilos. Now, somebody like me is definitely more than 68 kilos. And I mean, I should not end up in a scenario where I don't let others also vote. So we calculate for a max and an average loading of 80%. So now let's look at the rest of the, uh, how this H and S are calculated. H and S are statistical uh, functions. Uh, keep in mind what I said that, you know, we are trying to set an average in terms of the highest reversal floor and average number of uh, stops. Uh, it's based on the rectangular distribution formula. Again, Forget about uh, uh, the, the formula I said, but look at the components. So if you have a building which is, let's say, ground plus one, the highest reversal flow will definitely be one. Now, let's look at what P says. P is the average uh, uh, car loading. So suppose you have a, uh, a one-passenger elevator, and okay, let's assume 100% car loading. So the number of probable stops is one. Uh, so the, this is, again, we need to remember that the more the, the moment we have more number of stops, the moment we have uh, a higher distance to be traveled, the moment we have larger car capacities, your H and S increases. Uh, 
Uh, and now let us go and uh, look at what H and S is. H and S, as what what's your the statistical function, has got nothing to do with speed, has got nothing to do with <clears throat> uh, any other aspects of the elevator acceleration. It doesn't have anything to do with it. It has simply got to do with the number of probable stops and your uh, uh, car capacity. So suppose we are talking about uh, uh, a 10 passenger elevator, 80% average loading, and suppose it is 20, we have a probable uh, highest reversal flows as 18.2 and probable number of stops is 6.7. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you go to uh, a 16 passenger elevator or 26 passenger, 26, 80% will be 28.8 and uh, 20 flows, you have 19.5 average uh, uh, highest reversal flow and 13.1 as your uh, average number of stops. So you see what, <clears throat> what happens, the difference between a 10 passenger elevator and a 26 passenger elevator. As the capacity increases, the probable number of stops and your highest reversal floor uh, changes. Now, this is uh, something which is uh, you can work out of tables because uh, it's, uh, it's not going to be linked to your elevator speed or other uh, parameters. Okay, so we talked about H, we talked about S, we talked about P. Now, what is TH? So we talked about we talked about the fact that okay if it is uh, <coughs> a thirty floor building and uh, your uh, highest average uh, reversal floor is likely to be twenty five and four meters uh, floor to floor height it is four into twenty five is hundred uh, meters so two h into t h will give you assuming the elevator just goes and goes up and comes down it will take two into h into t h highest reversal floor is your uh, 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 20, uh, 20, 25, 25 into four meters divided by uh, the speed of the elevator will give you your uh, uh, time that will be taken. But now that is not the only component of the elevator because there is an acceleration involved, there's a deceleration involved, there is a door opening, there's a door closing. So then you come to the next component, which is S plus one, your average number of probable stops. The elevator goes, drops the people up, then comes down to the ground floor and opens the door again. So that is the S plus one into TS. Now TS is calculated in terms of the door operating time, that is the closing and the opening, uh, the single uh, floor time, which would take care of your acceleration, deceleration, the travel distance minus TH. <clears throat> now TH very simply put across, suppose it's a four meter floor to floor height and the average speed is uh, four meter per second, then your single floor transit time is taken as one meter, uh, one meter per uh, second. Sorry, one, uh, one second. Now, remember what, what we are talking about. The way it has been calculated, it's your average passengers carried, you are, you are uh, uh, assuming your established your H and your S, then based on your uh, 2H, your highest reversal floor, you have established the time it will take to travel up, assuming there's no door opening, door closing, assuming that <clears throat> there's no acceleration, deceleration. Then when you come into calculating the TS, you are then accounting for the losses on account of your door opening, door closing, your acceleration, deceleration. So the moment S increases, uh, either by virtue of the fact that you've got a larger capacity or by virtue of the fact that the building is significantly taller, your uh, time loss on account of this will become significantly higher. <clears throat> then of course, your passenger transfer uh, time, 2P into TP. Uh, so I had a, a interesting situation with uh, a prominent, very prominent engineering company of this uh, uh, in, 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 in India. So they were doing the traffic analysis and I did the session and at the end of the session, one of the gentlemen, a fairly senior gentleman came to me and said, you know, every time I was increasing the passenger capacity because I didn't want to provide more elevators. And then I realized that I was landing up in a worse situation. So again, let us look at it. Round tip time is impacted by your highest reversal floor, which in turn is a, is a function of the number of floors and your passenger capacity. It is impacted by your T8. This is where the speed uh, factor comes into the picture. It is impacted by the probable number of stops, which is a function of your uh, car capacity. Uh, TS is, uh, uh, if you have a very inefficient door, you could have a problem. If you have a very low acceleration, deceleration, you could again have a problem. And then T, uh, 2 into P into TP, which again, if you have a large elevator, your time goes on. So this is where the round trip time is for a single elevator. Okay, now from the round trip time, you then calculate the five minute handling capacity. So it is uh, 300 and this is a pure up peak. 300 divided by RT, 300 is your five minutes, uh, five into uh, 60. 
300 divided by RTT will give you the number of trips and a single elevator could make in a uh, five minute period. Into uh, P, your average uh, car loading, into uh, L. So suppose uh, it is 300 divided by RTT for the purpose of ease, I will say that, okay, RTT is 60, 50 seconds. So 300 divided by 50 is uh, six. <clears throat> and assuming uh, P is, uh, is uh, 20, again, for the purpose of uh, ease, six into 20 is 120. And suppose we have uh, uh, five lifts in a group, it is 120 into five, it gives you 600 people. It's what the system could handle in a five minute period. This obviously uh, has no meaning unless you relate it to the percentage of the total population. Uh, because that is what makes a difference. So if you have a building which has uh, got 500 people and a building which has got 5,000 people, this obviously has uh, a difference. Uh, then you have interval, which is round trip time divided by L. Again, a very simple thing. So if your round trip time is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, 50 seconds and you've got five lifts, so your interval will become 10 seconds. I mean, that is uh, statistically average. On an average, you will have one elevator leaving in every uh, 10 seconds. Now, remember again, these are all statistical functions. These are all probability uh, functions. In real life, the chances are this will all get worse. We will discuss this as we go along. At this point, one of the things that I would like to clarify here is when we talk about L, each of these L statistically is the number of lifts in the group. Uh, it is not a situation where uh, we have elevators anywhere in the building and say that, okay, this is my handling capacity. It's not. Like, for instance, round trip time, the reason why I'm dividing round trip time divided by L is because that we have statistically the probability that one elevator would be available. And for that, it is essential that uh, the lifts are meaningfully positioned and meaning, uh, meaningfully in, uh, put in a way that it can be grouping can be allowed. The National Building Board does give some uh, arrangements. Uh, we do talk about uh, uh, four elevators uh, in, in a bank as your maximum with destination control. Probably you could push it to uh, five elevators. Well, obviously not uh, eight or 10 or 12 elevators in a single, uh, single line. So I, I would assume that everybody would think, oh, this is very uh, meaningful and this is uh, logical. I mean, it's uh, simple uh, common sense. Uh, however, uh, uh, that's not the experience. We have seen uh, numerous buildings and uh, the next uh, slides, uh, the examples that I give, I, I would request that let's not get into identifying, trying to identify which project it is, because it is something which we will find at our door often. Uh, and I mean, I could have picked up uh, buildings from anywhere, but I thought I'll just pick up two random uh, buildings, which sort of showcase how we lack in the understanding of what requires to be done on something that should be very simple and common sense. <clears throat> so the first uh, building, uh, we've got lots of elevators. And uh, those of you uh, uh, operating in, uh, in Bombay will understand what is happening here. We are trying to maximize FSI. Uh, this building, it's a, it's a fairly tall building, requires six elevators in a group for the main passenger elevators. Now we have uh, seven passenger elevators and two service elevators. <coughs> and there is no way we can meaningfully group these elevators. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Economics came into the position here, and the, the thought was that, okay, let us get the economics in place, let us get the FSI, let us get the benefit of that, and the elevators are put in together. I do not know what is going to be happening to this building finally when it gets uh, fully occupied. What I suspect will happen, even if they have used destination control, I suspect that there would be a situation where people would start calling for multiple elevators. So now, instead of one elevator serving a person, there could be multiple elevators. Like, for instance, uh, these two elevators are in a group. You push a button over here. Uh, the person is not too sure whether these are the elevators that are going to come. So he pushes calls for these two elevators too. Maybe even these two elevators. So now suddenly you have two elevators addressing one call, which means our RTT, our round trip time, our all uh, things goes for a, goes for a toss. Uh, the next uh, uh, building, again, uh, my request is let's not try to identify the building. It doesn't matter. Uh, we already have a problem with a long uh, lobby. It's uh, eight elevators facing eight elevators. Grouping is going to be a problem because uh, somebody who has to reach these elevators will have a problem. But what I found interesting is that there was a, a traffic analysis uh, report that was submitted, a recommendation that was submitted, where these green elevators are expected to be grouped together. Now, I do not know which technology or what technology can enable this to happen. Now, on a piece of paper, it has been put together and uh, it said that, okay, fine, we need uh, so many X number of elevators. 
It's just incidental that part of the elevators are in Churchgate and part of the elevators are in uh, VTCSD. Uh, and this is a fact. This is something which should be common sense. I mean, we need to recognize that none of us are PT Usha, that we need, we can't expect our users to be running around or pushing and jostling to get into an elevator. It has to be something which is easy and something which is to be uh, 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 something which facilitates their life in that uh, building. Unfortunately, the situation is, uh, is like this. Okay, so uh, traffic analysis, uh, we need to recognize that it is not an exact science. There are a lot of assumptions that go in, which are in many ways ideal. Now we do come across situations where uh, the client says, no, no, let us take a little bit of, a, of, a, of an adjustment over here. But we need to recognize the adjustment has already been made because when we do that traffic analysis, uh, there's already assumptions of, uh, of uh, uh, which, which assumptions which indicate that possibly the system is in an ideal situation. One example is the traffic pattern assumed is a pure up peak. That means people come in at the ground floor and then they will go to their floor and that's it. So there's only one person using it. And we know for a fact that there could be somebody who goes up to uh, you know, pick up some stuff and then runs off for a meeting or somebody comes up and uh, maybe decides to go for breakfast or something like that. We know that this happens. Uh, we again assume that people arrive in a rectangular probability distribution. That means at every point of time, the elevators are filled to an 80% which we again know never happens because people will come in bits and pieces. That is uh, the reality of life. There's an assumption that the floors will be equally populated, which we again know never happens depending upon the tenant. Uh, the rated speed is achieved in a single floor jump. Remember what I said, it is uh, your uh, TH, uh, which again, depending upon the height of the building, depending upon the speed of the building, it might not necessarily be uh, achieved in a single floor. Uh, in the floor heights are equal. Uh, the door dwell time does not exceed the calculated passenger tra transfer time. Now, A to G, none of these things are real life ideal situation. So if at the time of your traffic analysis and your time of calculations, we already start taking out, taking out uh, stuff saying that, okay, we'll manage with this. Or suppose we say that, okay, fine, I don't have uh, uh, the required handling capacity, but I'll manage with lower, or I don't have the interval. We need to recognize that that, uh, that handling capacity and that interval has already been achieved based on, uh, on an ideal uh, situation. Uh, other factors that do affect our special building facilities. Yes, uh, in recent times, some things that do happen is that we'll have a cafeteria on the topmost floor, we'll have a town hall, we'll have restaurants. Now, all these add up your uh, uh, elevator ineffectiveness. I mean, if you have a cafeteria, if you have a town hall, you have a restaurant, you have to provide for more uh, elevators. Multiple entry levels is a big issue. And uh, many of us design buildings with expecting elevators to uh, uh, serve multiple entry levels. And the example that I often give is, suppose we want to take the Rajdhani from here to uh, Delhi, and the Rajdhani we have to be stopping at uh, CST, then uh, uh, all the stations all along the way, picking up people, it's no longer going to be the Rajdhani. Just imagine the bullet train that is being planned from, uh, from Ahmedabad, and it starts stopping at every station. The bullet train is no longer the bullet uh, train. Uh, non-smoking buildings, yes, I'm a non-smoker and I, I really do support it, but it has an impact on elevators because if people have to keep going down to smoke, <clears throat> and uh, what I found about smokers is they do not go in ones and twos, they will go along with groups. And that again has an impact on elevators, VIP lifts. Uh, if you are providing VIP lifts, please recognize that these VIP lifts have to be over and above what the building requires. Uh, service lifts is an issue that is coming up in <coughs> residential buildings. Uh, they want service elevators separate from the main uh, elevators. Uh, however, what people do need to recognize is that service lifts, again, will have to be over and above your main elevators. It cannot be part of your uh, calculation and your adequacy uh, for the building. Okay, now understanding uh, handling capacity and arrival rate. One of the biggest uh, mistakes that happen in traffic analysis is uh, handling capacity as we define is what the system can handle. Arrival rate, on the other hand, is what people will actually do at what is your going to be arrival rate. The design objective has to be to ensure that the handling capacity exceeds the peak arrival rate or matches the peak arrival rate. I've seen traffic analysis being done where, uh, uh, you know, you put in a handling, I mean, arrival rate of 6% or 8% or 10%, to a certain population say, okay, this is the handling capacity of the system. That is not it. The system <clears throat> has, the handling capacity of the system has to be calculated based on your uh, traffic analysis. And the handling capacity, again, uh, for uh, a commercial building, I will go into the details later on, 
has to be a minimum of 10% for multi-tenant and 15% for single-tenant buildings. Uh, very simple reason, a single-tenant, the possibility, the diversity would be significantly lower. There's a possibility that their arrival rates be together, the town halls, everything will be together. So you would need a higher uh, handling capacity. And if by any chance the building is closer to one of your mass rapid transport systems or a very uh, <clears throat> fast uh, uh, highway, you would need to uh, have a higher uh, handling capacity. Uh, coming to interval, just to understand uh, what interval means uh, in terms of uh, the time difference between two elevators, keep your focus on your red car. So it reaches, it reaches halfway, it takes 30 seconds, then it reaches the top, it takes one minute, it uh, comes down to midway, it is one minute, 30 seconds, and it comes to the bottom, it is two minutes. So the round trip time of the red car was 120 seconds. Uh, remember what we uh, calculated? Because there are four cars, we assume that the interval is uh, 30 seconds. So the reason why I'm clarifying on this is there is often a confusion that happens that when we have calculated the interval, there's a confusion that happens which says that round interval is equal to average waiting time. Now, average waiting time is a time that a person has to actually wait. And in many ways is what a user or a tenant is going to be really bothered about. He's not going to be bothered about handling capacity and interval. They are, these are all design factors. Uh, we need to remember that average interval is not equal to, uh, uh, so average waiting time is not equal to intervals. And these terms cannot be interchangeably used. Uh, we do find situations where <clears throat> the interval looks good. So if you have a one passenger elevator, for instance, you will have great interval. Uh, a case in point that we have is uh, Nariman Point and uh, Cup Parade, where elevators come down very fast, but because they are, and they come down very fast, interval is very good because the elevators are small. However, there's a huge queue which goes out into the, into the driveway. Uh, the relationship between interval and waiting time is not that uh, simple, very simply because, uh, like I said, you know, uh, people do not come in rectangular distribution formula. They do not come in bit. In bit. It has to be something that has to be established uh, on a uh, basis of uh, simulation. Uh, it is going to be a function of what the arrival rate and the handling capacity is. So if you have a handling capacity that is lower than the arrival rate, the interval will look good, but your average waiting time would be uh, uh, bad. Uh, it's also a function of your dispatching system. Like for instance, if it's a, if it's a destination control or if it's an early car allocation, you would have uh, uh, average waiting time, which could be better, which could be better. I'm, uh, mind you, I'm repeating, could be better. But then again, it is dependent upon your handling capacity and arrival rate, how it matches up. So again, uh, we did uh, interval, we talked about average waiting time, but there are other factors that also need to be considered become, become, become more predominant or which becomes a matter of concern <clears throat> I think I'm running a little over time, but I think I'll try to finish in the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so the taller the building, we need to then slowly shift our focus from just average waiting time, interval, or handling capacity. I'm not saying that we ignore them, but they also need to be considered. So for instance, Raghu arrives, uh, Anita arrives, and then we have Anita's waiting time, which looks very good, very uh, small waiting time. Raghu's waiting time is longer. However, Anita's time to destination, because she's on an upper floor, is much longer than Raghu's time to destination. Uh, the point here is, depending upon the, the height of the building, at one point of time, we need to be shifting our focus after establishing the handling capacity and after establishing the interval and after establishing the average lighting time. <clears throat> we need to check as to what is going to be happening in time to destination. What is the journey time that is uh, involved? Uh, and typically, Unless it's like a super tall building, which like the Burj Khalifa or something like that, you should try to always ensure that your time to destination, the journey time inside the elevator is, uh, is not more than uh, 60 seconds. And uh, keep in mind, uh, more number of stops, more number of openings uh, is an irritant. More number of stops, more number of openings uh, is going to ensure that the, per the person who has to go, Anita, is going to get very, very upset because, you know, the door has opened for uh, Rego over here. So... Talking about traffic analysis, uh, we establish handling capacity interval. We probably do a simulation to find out what your average waiting time is. And from there, we do not end the story there. We go on to find out what is the ideal speed trying to ensure that the journey time is also in control. An example that I will give for this uh, scenario is suppose we are designing the building for uh, Mr. Mukesh Ambani and you know, he has got his uh, penthouse uh, office. Now, his uh, elevator would probably be used by him and maybe his uh, close associates or maybe his uh, security or whatever it is. And we would have an average waiting time, which is excellent because the elevator will always be waiting for him. We will have a handling capacity, which is probably uh, <clears throat> um, 
maybe 100 percent because again it is one elevator and you'll probably have a 30 passenger elevator at this uh, at this service but then we could not base our speed and say oh the handling capacity is good the interval is very good uh, average waiting time is good and then have a slow speed elevator so it's not possible so keep this in mind it is just not one aspect you need to constantly keep iterating and keep checking as to what is happening around the rest of the the building okay uh simulations again a word of caution here uh we do have often have situations where uh, there is a, a traffic analysis report that has been submitted which is based totally on simulations <clears throat> we need to remember that uh, software depending upon the software there is different algorithms and different logic that is used uh vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a formula a formula depending upon who calculates it one plus one has to be equal to two but if it's a simulation we might end up with different results <clears throat> and it's very essential that uh, you know we do an apple to apple comparison always uh, and again, in simulation, the problem is there are inconsistent uh, definitions, uh, data in, data out, garbage in, garbage out. That's always a problem. Uh, and key is to always ensure that the assumptions are right and the interpretations are right. In any case, whatever happens, the first principle that the classic calculations have to be done before we get into simulation for optimization and fine tuning. And this is not just me saying, this is what also the National Building Code uh, says. So the National Building Code, if you look at part eight, section uh, uh, 5A, it gives a very simple logical uh, flow chart on how you need to be going about calculations. You establish uh, the pattern, your population, et cetera, et cetera, number of flows, flow flat, total population. You do your peak analysis. You establish what is required. And once you have established your handling capacity and your uh, interval, target interval that is met, then you do simulations to optimize. Then you do uh, simulations with a dispatch control like a DCS or early car location and optimize it. And once that is done, that is when you will arrive at your uh, traffic analysis and the number of elevators that you require. If you start with the simulation first, in the first instant, first of all, you would not have an apple to apple scenario. And because the algorithms could be different and you could have the simulation done by X and you could end up with a situation where it is Y who is uh, supplying the elevators. And we could end up in a situation where uh, none of the things uh, fall into place. Uh, during, just before the lockdown, rather during the lockdown, we had a had a uh, four towers which were uh, we were discussing with with the, the owners and uh, we were thrown a report which said that the buildings were all good now, our reports were indicating that the average times were like you know uh, three minutes four minutes five minutes and then we went into what had happened on that report which indicated that everything was good and we realized that it was based on a simulation and uh, like I said, you know, your algorithm was totally uh, different and uh, they are not gone to the first principles. Finally, when they went into the first principles, they all came to the conclusion that the buildings were uh, inadequately uh, elevated. Uh, could anything be done? Nothing could be done because it was too late. Okay, uh, again, uh, something that we uh, often end up with a problem, uh, we need to recognize the crucial input is something that has to come from the developer, has to come from the architect. This is not something that we need to manipulate, but we need to be very realistic about it. It's essential that we establish the realistic average traffic. Uh, one of the issues that we again come across is that uh, the flow efficiency and leasable area. So when a, a customer or a developer is trying to sell something, he tries to sell floor efficiency. Now, finally, when a tenant comes in, he has a reception area, he has a meeting room, he has a common. Now, these are extra places. These are extra chairs, which do not necessarily add up into elevator traffic. Do you need that for your HVAC? Definitely. Do you need it for your lighting? Definitely. But do you need it for your elevators? The answer is no. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done into doing this. I, I remember that I was uh, one of the first projects that I was doing for uh, one of the major developers in India. Uh, we had a huge discussion where we came up with a, with a recommendation of 10 square meters uh, per person on, uh, on uh, net usable area. And uh, the, the sales team came in to say, no, 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 it is not 10 uh, square meters per net usable area. It is 10.5 square meters on built up area. Uh, of course, I mean, I could do the traffic analysis and I could uh, give, a, give a, a solution which would have ended up with uh, more elevators than that would be required, which again is as criminal as not having enough uh, elevators. Uh, finally, what we did is uh, good sense prevailed. The developers, uh, the owners, uh, and the architect said, okay, let us go and do a check of all the other buildings that have been done. We did a check of all the other buildings that were done and it came to 12 square meters on net usable area. Of course, since that point of time, <clears throat> we have taken 10 square meters on net usable area as uh, our uh, reference. And in the last uh, 16 years, 
We have not had a single building having had a problem. Of course, no, I, I won't say we didn't have a problem. We did have a problem on two buildings. And uh, the reason why we had two problems, the two buildings is one, uh, the tenant decided to add a cafeteria in between. And like I mentioned earlier, cafeteria had a problem. In another instant, the tenant decided to ignore all our design uh, uh, recommendations. So you had uh, elevators going where they should not be going. You had uh, escalators provided for the cafeteria, but because the elevators are opening up, we ended up having a problem. Uh, we also need to keep in mind there's a challenge of a 24-7 building uh, because uh, then your entire traffic pattern again becomes different and you need to spend time understanding this. Now, if you look at the National Building Code of 2016, there's been a significant level of clarity that has been uh, been provided. And I, I often uh, would tell architects or developers who says, how fast can you generate a traffic analysis report or recommendation? I keep saying that the speed of generating the report is immaterial. What is required is that we have clarity in terms of what the population is, what the building is going to do. And that probably needs to take more time than just the traffic analysis and the calculations. Some of the recommendations, uh, I did mention multiple tenant, uh, it is 10 to 15, single tenancy is 15 to 25. Uh, and if you are not sure about your uh, tenancy, my suggestion would always be, let's go on error on uh, the thing where maybe you need to be looking at 13 to 14% as your quality of service. <clears throat> in travel, uh, for heaven's sake, do not look at anything less than good because as the building progresses or if there's a change in the building, we have a problem. Uh, table seven, the recommended handling capacity for residential buildings. Those of you who remember 2005, we had a single 7.5% as uh, uh, the handling capacity for uh, buildings. We broke it up into high-end, mid-end, low-end buildings, 8%, uh, 6 to 8%, 5 to 7%. Uh, so uh, does that mean the low-end building would require lesser elevators? The answer is no. Because a high-end building and a low-end building, the densities differ. A low-end residential building will have a higher, uh, uh, higher uh, density, uh, which means a 5 to 7% would probably equal, in terms of number of elevators, to a high-end building with an 8% uh, handling capacity. So, but, but the only reason why we did this, when we broke it up into these uh, things, is to ensure that we don't use a low density and use a high uh, handling capacity. Because that would have been a double uh, double whammy. So uh, just because it's a low-end building doesn't mean that you do away with, uh, with elevators. Uh, again, in terms of interval, that is where probably you could compromise a little bit of speed, but you obviously definitely cannot compromise in the number of uh, elevators. Okay, now here is where I'm, I'm introducing something which uh, is not necessarily part of traffic analysis. And this is again a clarity. This is for uh, builders, developers, architects, uh, and also for the elevator industry. There is a, a mistaken notion that, uh, okay, we do not have enough elevators, let us put destination control and let us uh, resolve the problems. Now here it is very essential to understand how the conventional system works <clears throat> and how, the, how uh, DCS works, the destination control works. Uh, first is the car load is established based on a formula, which incidentally this formula is something that is applicable around the world. If you go to US also, uh, it is the same formula which is used for establishing the car load. Uh, of course, it is established in kilos, and then uh, depending upon your uh, 68 kilos or 75 kilos, that is how the number comes out. Uh, so when we did the conventional, I told you to make a note about uh, that calculation, average car loading of 80%. Now, when you talk about an average of 80%, we have a situation where the car load could also be 100%. We know that if the building is, uh, is heavily packed and the buildings are under-elevated, uh, invariably, uh, it is a lift elevator who decides whether it should move or not because your load weighing device will come into effect and say the pip, pip, pip sound will come out and say that somebody has to uh, step out. Uh, you could also have a situation where somebody refuses to get into the elevator because uh, uh, this personal space, you know, your personal space is a, is a priority. Conventional, you have an average loading of 80%. However, when it comes to destination control, the whole system is, uh, is very different. Your maximum car loading is not more than 80%. Uh, in fact, I know uh, often many of the places the system is set for a 50 to 70 percent, and here it is needed because destination control counts the number of people, while the conventional control, the elevator moves on basis of <clears throat> the load inside the car. So the reason why it has to be set for 50 to 70 percent or less than 80 percent as your maximum car loading is because of the average weight. Remember, I told you that uh, you know I'm. 68 kilos means I would occupy, if 68 kilos is the average weight, I would probably occupy in the space of one and a half uh, people. I'm being very uh, nice to myself when I say this. <clears throat> now, if a person has been allotted a particular elevator and the car is already overloaded, what happens? The person has to go out and re-enter the 
call. So because of that, you need to ensure that you do not load it to its maximum level. You also need to account for uh, tailgating. That is somebody who comes in, does not give a call and then walks in and occupies somebody's uh, seat. Of course, in a train, you can always manage that because uh, the train doesn't really, uh, is not going to be too bothered about the, the loading that is involved. To keep in mind that destination control is not the solution if you do not have an adequately elevated building. Yes, if it's a borderline case, okay, you need a handling capacity of uh, uh, 12% and your handling capacity is probably about 11.3 or 11%. Yes, destination control would, <coughs> would work. So does, does this mean that I'm saying destination control should not be used? Sorry, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is destination control should not be considered as your your uh, solution for a badly elevated building. The elevator has, the building has to be designed as is required. And then you use destination control to improve the effectiveness of the, the elevators. And the way destination control operates is by reducing the probable number of stops. The S in our round trip calculation gets reduced and your H gets reduced. And that's how destination control works. So do not expect that it will do a total balancing uh, in terms of uh, that 80% average vis-a-vis -vis maximum of uh, 80%. So bear this in mind. So if any supplier comes and says, oh, you don't have enough elevator, let us put in destination control. Sometimes the situation could get worse because uh, our destination control would have lesser number of people that can go in. But in a, a conventional system, I mean, something like the Japanese rail where you can push people into it till the lift says no more, you can push in, uh, push in people. So keep I bear this in mind when you get into, uh, into uh, design. In fact, we have to oh. hurry up. We are uh, almost 55 minutes uh, on this. So yes, I will need, I will will need uh, four more uh, minutes, five more, okay. four more minutes. Okay. Okay, I mean, I, it's, it's unfortunately a situation. It's a subject which requires to be addressed. Uh, I mean, I, I thought I could have rushed it through, but uh, I have two ways. Okay, the impact of uh, COVID-19. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion during the early days saying that, oh, maybe we need to change the National Building Code to take care of uh, COVID-19. And uh, I mean, my response to that was that if the building is adequately elevated in the first instant uh, with uh, the COVID-19 requirement of having lesser uh, people in the lift, uh, you do not have a problem. So like for instance, uh, you take 80% average car loading, 60 for a 20 and you go to 20% or if it's 50% uh, loading, your average waiting time is just 19.2. But on the other hand, if your building is badly elevated in the first instant, it's going to be a crisis. It's going to be chaos. So there is nothing that needs to be changed in the National Building Code uh, for accommodating the COVID. What requires to be done is that you design the building adequately as per the requirements of the National Building Code and will take care of all your requirements. So what are the common errors that uh, come in? Uh, people ignore the criticality of elevating. I mean, I can't say this adequately enough. Uh, we do have a serious issue. Uh, buildings are doing design without uh, a DBR. There's no design basis. It's like the next building. Okay, the last building, I did three elevators. So let me do three and a half here. Uh, population numbers. This is a, a recent trend that has come in. Okay, fine. I mean, I'm not getting 10%. So let me reduce the denominator so that I get a, a population number that looks good. Uh, NBC 2016 provisions are being ignored. I mean, I have had a sad scenario where there are people who have told me that, oh, but at the end of the day, there are recommendations. Why should we necessarily follow them? Uh, speeds based on firemen lift, uh, uh, elevating designs, I mean, being done without understanding what elevators is, that's a problem, confusing handling capacity and arrival rate, confusing travel and average waiting time. Uh, you skip the first calculation and, you know, you do simulations because it's all very nice uh, uh, software and uh, proposing uh, destination control as a remedy for inadequate uh, elevating. Uh, another key point, I did mention this in the first instant, uh, our firemen and evacuation elevators, the key issue is that elevators are not waterproof or fireproof. They need to be in a protected lobby. And if they are not in a protected lobby, this is something that I have been telling uh, firemen around the country for the last uh, 10, 11 years, that if the lifts are not in a protected lobby, for heaven's sake, please do not use the elevators. And this cannot be done unless it is handled in the design uh, state. Uh, standards and codes. We have uh, standards and codes. I mean, unlike what uh, people think or say that, oh, India doesn't have standards and codes, we do have standards and codes. The fact is that we need to follow the standards and codes. The IS 14665, which has been in existence now for about 11 years, sorry, about 20 years now, uh, will be replaced by an ISO adapted version of ISO 8100 part one and two. It's under uh, print at the moment and before the end of the year, it would be released. And we do have a uh, good, uh, uh, 
standards and codes. In fact, the traffic analysis and recommendations for building elevator design is probably found only in the Indian national codes. You will not find it anywhere else in the world, whether it is Europe, Europe does not have one. Uh, the US does not have one. In the international building code, you will not find this requirement. They all come as subsections I mean, uh, published by uh, association. Like for instance, the SIPSI guide D gives these uh, recommendations, but it is not a national uh, code. Uh, so to just to sort of conclude, recognize the signs, respect the criticality, react in time. Please, for heaven's sake, if you do plan to get into traffic analysis, you plan to give recommendations for buildings, get in, understand the science, understand what requires to be done, convert the science into theory. Otherwise, for heaven's sake, please recognize that we do not have an alternative. Uh, or perhaps the old Indian rope trick. Uh, I mean, we've got other unable to pose a question can always use this number to send a WhatsApp or email ID. Our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Vincent Pinto from Schindler. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have two important um, uh, speakers, Vincent Pinto and Ashish Thakkan, who's going to talk about the technology uh, pertaining to today's uh, pandemic situation. So I would uh, request uh, Mr. Pinto to uh, come and share his uh, experience and his knowledge on um, elevator industry. And as we all know, he's the vice president of Schindler India and over 19, year, over 19 years of experience in crafting and executing uh, result driven business strategies. And I'm sure we're going to enjoy his session, next session. Over to uh, Vincent Pinto. Unmute, unmute, uh, Vincent. Yes, yeah. thank you for me to share my screen. Wonderful. Let me know when you see it. Yeah, can a little you louder, it? please. Yes, can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, we can see the screen, but we can't hear you properly. Okay, now is it fine? No, not yet. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be louder so that... Yeah, that's fine. Right. Now much better. That's fine. Okay. So thank you once again, Dominic, uh, for the opportunity. And thank you, Tag, for the wonderful session. A uh, special thank you to Sandeep from not only me, from the industry. I think you spoke very highly about the vertical transportation industry. You know, it's rare for us to hear this. And good afternoon to all the listeners for this webinar. Let me take you through the session from Schindler. Uh, on the topic which was mentioned. Now, what you see here is how the vertical transportation industry has evolved over the past few decades. Schindler has been innovative to address the market needs and their challenging requirements. So what you see here is from a conventional control through traffic management, transit management, to finally transit intelligence. You see here different solutions which Schindler brings in to solve today's vertical transportation industry challenges. Um, what made it possible or where did it come from? The demand which comes from the complex building, you know, to keep what TAC was talking about, handling capacity and the traffic and control, that was one main reason for this evolution. And also the preferences, the changing preferences and customer expectations put together, you know, that's what give rise to this different technology. Uh, gone are the days when, you know, elevators would be seen only as a vertical transportation medium. If we stick to the conventional control, typically, if I look at a very, very high rise building, most of the space would be occupied by the number of shafts. And we definitely don't build buildings only to accommodate lifts. So destination control is one way to optimize the elevators and also reduce the overall travel time to destination. Further, uh, the new challenges on security, access control, touchless were also addressed by Schindler almost 20 years ago using Myconic 10 and Schindler ID. With port, we not only ensure high traffic capacity but also enhance the overall experience. More than just an app, my port is a complete mobile strategy allowing users to get where they need to be with all the access guidance and transportation need 
organized via their own smartphones. So this is what we see how uh, different technologies have evolved over a period of time. Let's see how it works for video. Vertical transportation has evolved. Introducing Schindler Port Technology. Port technology will not only save you time, but also offer greater efficiency and comfort. By grouping people based on destination, the system is designed to eliminate overcrowding and unnecessary stops, thereby reducing travel time and ensuring a more comfortable passenger experience. Each of the lifts have been assigned a letter as opposed to the traditional lift number. You can access any of the floors that are displayed on the port terminal by simply touching the screen. When you request a floor, you will be given a lift allocation. This is the lift you need to take to get to your requested floor. Taking any other lift will not take you to your floor. It is extremely important that all passengers select a floor, even if you are travelling to the same floor. This will help to avoid overcrowding and maintain travel efficiency. You can confirm your floor selection by checking this display as you enter the lift. Once inside the lift, you will notice that there are no floor buttons, as your lift is already programmed to travel to your requested floor. Depending on your building layout, you may be issued a security swipe card to access secured floors. These cards can be pre-programmed with a home floor. To access your home floor, simply approach one of the port terminals and present your card as shown. You will then be allocated a lift, which will take you automatically to your floor. To access a secured floor other than your home floor, approach one of the port terminals and present your card. Now select Change Destination. Then select your new floor. You will then be allocated a lift. Proceed to your lift, which will take you automatically to your floor. Once on a floor, you can return to the ground floor by selecting ground at any of the port terminals. For people with special requirements, you can use this button to assist you with the operation of the lifts. This group serves floor 1 through 7. Please press again when you hear your destination. 1, 2, 3, 3, car A, 2, right. What are the next challenges now when we see one is we are not alone there are several systems working in the building elevator is just one of them the new challenge is to bring these together you know so solving the traffic the handling capacity uh, destination time reduction is one and integrating different systems together is another if we do not do this well the entire system reliability is at question. So how can we solve this new problem, which comes by putting things together? Schindler MyPort tries to solve this challenges by integrating few of the services systems together in a seamless way and tries to enhance the overall customer experience. With MyPort, we bring different services systems together like parking system, visitor control, elevator control, and also the door lap. More than just a mobile application, MyPort users have access to advanced visitor management feature and can use a mobile device as a video intercom to speak directly to a visitor. You know, calling from uh, a MyPort visitor terminal, you can directly get in touch with the uh, resident or the user and access the elevator even if you are a visitor to the building. So some of the applications and examples are explained here. So let's say as an example, a resident accessing elevator using a card or in my port app gets assigned elevator to his floor and enjoys a seamless experience with the port terminal, including the apartment door. On the right, you see how a visitor calls a resident, gets an access through the port and then gets to the apartment. 
If I compare now to a commercial building, an employee approaches a speed gate with his car or my port app and gets an elevator assigned. On the right, you again see a visitor, how a employee can generate a code, send it to the visitor, and through this visit, through this code, a visitor can access the elevators without any hassle. Another system which can be integrated together is the parking system, which can also be equipped with my port, with port, and then all the visitors can also go through the parking system hassle free, or the residents can use the same. Let's see it together in a video how this is used. Today we will demonstrate how a Today we will demonstrate how a Schindler product extension of our world-leading port technology can be used to move seamlessly through a building. Called MyPort, this smartphone-based application enables a new level of security and convenience to be attained. Movement through the barrier system of the user's office is extremely simple using MyPort. But this simplicity belies a very deep level of applied security. Let's back up and take a closer look. As soon as a user with the MyPort application walks into the lobby, they are detected by the port system, which communicates with a remote server. This then sends a code to their phone number. This causes a message to be displayed and, once the phone has been unlocked with biometrics or the PIN code, it can be used to gain entry into the building. So we have multiple levels of security. The initial local wireless detection, the sending of a code to the phone number via the telecom system, the unlocking of the phone via biometrics or a PIN code, the presenting of the phone to the barrier port. This e-banking level of security gives a very high degree of assurance that the person in possession of the smartphone is properly authorised, which means that the remainder of their journey through the building can be made completely seamless as long as they have the phone on their person. Doors will be automatically unlocked, elevators will be ordered for preferred destinations or others if requested. The entire experience is one of total freedom of movement throughout the space. And very importantly, that freedom applies equally to disabled people who can now use the smartphone they are used to working with in their preferred individual configuration to easily navigate the building. Visitors who do not have MyPort installed on their smartphone can still benefit from the system. A building occupant can issue a visitor invitation which is transmitted as a simple text message containing a link. The visitor simply touches the link when they arrive at the office and receives a special video which is played and shown to the port. This colour encoded video cannot be copied and, since it does not require camera focusing, does not need precision placement on the port reader. Once the code is read, access is obtained to the building and an elevator assignment and directions can be given. At the same time, the person to be visited will get a text message letting them know their visitor has arrived and which elevator they are travelling on. The end of the day and we're returning to our apartment. Here, we can also use my port to gain entry and, once inside, our elevator is ready to bring us to our floor. Here, the apartment door can be automatically unlocked. Later, relaxing at home, there is a visitor at the outer door. Naturally, we can get up and use the port at the door to let them in, but this is inconvenient. So, with my port, we simply access this information directly. We can check who the visitor is and, with one button, unlock the door and send an elevator to get them. MyPort is a major addition to the functionality of port technology. 
With it, we can allow many more people to experience the benefits of port and the lifestyle enhancements that go with it. Port, because many small things make one big difference. This is all from Schindler, where we show you how my port helps in integrating access control and high level of security. Thank you. Over to you, Dominic. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, wonderful to see uh, artificial intelligence is, is now playing a major uh, access uh, management. And um, it's a new technology. So we're very well uh, you know, presented by Schindler. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vincent. We look forward to see you again and again. And I would request you to stay back uh, for the question and answer. And uh, again, uh, our third speaker, Mr. Uh, Ashish Dakan, uh, the one of the founding member of Focus and also the chairman of security in Focus. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he's going to present uh, uh, the technology related to the current uh, situation, current pandemic. How do you, you know, distinguish you know, people with uh, COVID positive or uh, negative people? I'm sure that's what is going to present. I'm just, uh, you know, uh, hoping that he's going to talk about it. And all of you know Ashish Dekan is a revolutionary and entrepreneur, the man who, uh, you know, handles the maximum CCTV business in India. And he has an excellent factory. It's a make in India. And... Um, his brand, Prama Hikvision, is a well-known, and uh, he doesn't need a new special introduction. And I will straight away go to Ashish Dakan to take over from here. Over to Ashish. Thank you, Dominic Ji. It was a wonderful session. I think, uh, you know, Matthew sir and uh, uh, Vincent uh, sir has talked very nicely. And, uh, you know, it was more learning for, uh, you know, us who are, you know, because I'm not to belong to uh, uh, this vertical transportation or building management industries, but, you know, from security industries. But it was good learning lessons from uh, Taksab. If I would attend three, four more lectures of Taksab, then I can also start consulting. It was that good. Thank yeah. you for the same. Always a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Hope so, you will not take you know, up your position. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I will. I mean, willing to share my experience, knowledge, anytime, any place, anywhere. All yeah. I need your time. Yeah, thank you, sir. thank you. So, uh, uh, respected uh, president and uh, all management councils and uh, distinguished panelists and uh, uh, you know focus members and friends. Uh, in uh, uh, you know today's challenging time, you know uh, we are addressing uh, uh, and uh, creating such a knowledge series uh, organized by Focus. Uh, it is a really wonderful uh, uh, you know awareness building for the entire industry. The, in today's theme, vertical transportation, I will just uh, give because it is already you know taken uh, so much of time. Uh, so I will not present right now. You know any PPTs. I'll just talk a few minutes and uh, you know we'll just get it over with that. So I'll just uh, brief, you know, about how technology will play a role here. More security, uh, uh, like security system, CCTV cameras. It is not only security systems. No, normally we just say that, you know, cameras are uh, CCTV cameras are for security purpose only. But it is a visual information, and uh, uh, it is a data, a type of a visual data, and how you know that data can be analyzed and integrated with the uh, different uh, building management solutions, including uh, uh, vertical transportation. So uh, the latest of AI, AI is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies is uh, uh, playing a major role in uh, uh, controlling, uh, uh, you know, uh, spread of current pandemic as well. And in current situation, important of movement control is very, very high because of such pandemic uh, situation, what is going on right now. And uh, normally life involves with, uh, you know, we just know that many people are uh, uh, moving inside the buildings and uh, in uh, like uh, crowded places uh, like uh, uh, airports and transport, uh, transportation locations, shopping centers, uh, office buildings and blocks and uh, uh, warehouses and other places where people are constantly moving and uh, passing to each other and uh, between the rooms and floors, you know, and uh, uh, in uh, uh, this way of life has been forced to hold and uh, restricted to stay 
uh, within either enclosed place or where you know the number of uh, uh, people transmission to lives uh, or you know the number of people uh, to occupy certain areas are limited and how technology can play a role here so to restrict the transmission at the same time we have to ensure that business and safety continues and we must also control the movement of the people and monitor them uh, so today we will discuss you know how ai artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, enable the latest uh, uh, surveillance uh, technologies uh, integrated with uh, access control, thermal imaging, smart uh, hardware and uh, software solutions, all how it can be integrated, stitched together and build a nice solutions all uh, in a time. Uh, because it is now, you know, last session, I will not go too much on technicality of the uh, entire solutions, but I'll just go and a uh, uh, little bit brief on the same. Uh, the challenges posed by pandemic are immense right now, and the uh, you know uh, the challenge today is how to control flow of the people uh, effectively, and uh, without affecting business interest. As we we adjust to new way of life, business must embrace innovative uh, ways to optimize the density and flow of the people through the premises to protect workers, customers, and visitors, while also protecting the business interest in current situation. So good news is that you know AI enabled video technologies can support businesses of all of the sizes in in uh, and uh, you know skills. Though the product, uh, though the detailed product and technology will be discussed, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, on the you know we can go more in detail later on. I would like to just highlight few of the useful technology. In that number one is a temperature screening and mask detection. Right now is very important uh, uh, when you know in vertical uh, flow transportations when you know we uh, we i heard uh, matthew sub has mentioned that you know a uh, number of people are uh, uh, entering and different formulas but you know in a, a current uh, uh, pandemic situation it get due to social distancing or uh, you know temperature uh, uh, high you know covid patients may come in so you know we have to control uh, the flow of the people also in that so temperature screening uh, is very very important before entering anybody uh, you know, in the building, uh, temperature need to scan, and there, there, you know, thermal and mass detection camera technology uh, ensure that people who are entering the premises are safe to enter in the location, and uh, at the first place with normal body temperature. AI-powered camera intelligently identify whether you know someone is wearing mask or no mask, and uh, while also effectively check the skin surface temperature, and those you know temperature measurement and mask can be integrated with you know your tongue style or flap barriers or maybe the lips access as well and if it is an abnormal temperature or uh, you know not wearing the mask it can be instructed or audible audible warnings over there the please wear your face mask uh, and if it is not then you know it won't allow or access till the time is properly you know temperature is within the control range or the face mask is uh, uh, is uh, put on then only the access control will allow or the lift will start operating so such integrations is very much Solution uh, given in last eight months of time. Access control and different types of movement barrier equipment are also play a very important role in integration with uh, such thermal temperature and mass detection systems. And stop abnormal uh, temperature. We, we also have you know uh, uh, access control systems with the uh, minmoi face detection uh, terminal. So, uh, you know, uh, where, uh, uh, you know, someone has already talked about visitor management systems uh, or such, you know, uh, 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 predefined people space are already in built in the systems. So those are people flow only uh, who are from the building, same premises, regular visitors, there's people faces will be recognized and access is given. If he is with a good temperature and, you know, face mask is on, then only the access control will operate and uh, to that known faces. And believe me, the uh, you know the access control uh, uh, camera will uh, recognize person's faces uh, even with the mask and you know uh, accurately, and it will allow the person if he is the belong to that person or visitor pass is being issued on that person's uh, uh, face with along with the face mask. Another solutions which we also can integrate with uh, you know uh, 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 lifts are flow control solutions the, uh, uh, for the entire buildings. Intelligent video cameras, such as uh, those uh, within flow control solutions, use people counting technology coupled with dynamic digital signage. So there will be a TV or digital signage will be given uh, dynamic digital signage to display how many people are entered 
on the building premises in the order to, in indoor or indoor or outdoor areas the number of occupancy increased beyond set limit of that building or that floor uh, and then you know the set of the building then camera integrated with door access control solutions will restrict the entry of the building you know uh, building which is to the safety level occupancy once the person goes out of that you know uh, that flow then only the another person will enter in so you know such access controls can be uh, flow control can be uh, you know monitored and measured that same solutions can be integrated with the uh, lifts as well and we can just monitor that you know how many people can come inside the lifts though then only you know a camera can play such roles and you can set dynamically numbers you know as per the uh, situations and norms given by the uh, you know covid norms are available so accordingly and depend on areas in the lift area you can keep such norms and can control flow control solutions using such uh, uh, you know surveillance technologies uh, another uh, role you know camera can play in a uh, uh, maintaining the discipline of social distancing so camera also detect the distance between two people or the crowds and, uh, and uh, you know um, um, uh, standing uh, and when camera identify that people are standing closer then pre, uh, then the predefined threshold it will trigger an alarm the camera can also be linked to digital signage to display or audible or audio visual both alarms and not it such uh, you know alarms and inform the uh, you know visitors or people who are standing in the lifts that uh, you know to maintain social distancing and you know we can just integrate and can do such uh, you know uh, solutions to enhance you know uh, and inform that you know this application in pandemic area putting the latest integration technology in practice we can also help to build a lot of application scenarios including vertical uh, uh, different vertical like you know ai enabled healthcare banking education retail hospitality tourism a place of workshops transportation and smart cities and including uh, scenarios of vertical transport transportation here uh, also you know uh, uh, something i learned from uh, you know uh, tak sab and uh, you know earlier presentations of uh, uh, sir uh, you know uh, key speaker uh, that uh, sanitization integration also were uh, being uh, uh, you know being displayed in uh, lifts area so that you know we can uh, access visual information and camera can play role here and can you know can give information to such a sanitization uh, uh, you know on or off and we can we can just enable or disable you know such on off using the camera and it will identify accurately that the lift is is occupied or not and can play uv right now or not uv uh, you know sanitization right now or not and it will just when lift is not in occupied position uh, you know it will uh, uh, do you uh, ultraviolet sanitization of the areas artificial intelligence with such you know vertical integration is opening different new innovatives and new innovation ideas and uh, we are uh, you know very proud to uh, integrate uh, such well temperature screening uh, with uh, video analytics and intelligent visitor management systems uh, uh, integrating and uh, you know begin the technology revolutions that promises health safety and security to all of our stakeholders so uh, you know uh, uh, that's it from uh, my side uh, let's stay strong india stay united and uh, stay motivated we will overcome surely this challenge uh, what is going on right now in uh, uh, current situation and uh, 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 over to you dominic ji thank you ashish ji uh, very shortly i try to run away uh, run uh, run after my presentation and you covered a lot of ground you covered a lot yeah. of ground yeah thank yeah. you ashish ji wonderful you are saying camera is not just a Uh, CCTV camera. It is a machine learning, and it can add a lot of value to the current situation. So you are talking about uh, thermal, uh, you know, images on the individual or surrounding. So wonderful. I am sure you will also have a lot of questions to come, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just before I hand over to our moderator, Mr. V. Suresh, and our uh, Sandeep Shekre, I just wanted to highlight that on fourth, we are going to have uh, electrical vertical going to present on performance of. electrical system with safety at building upgradation most of the building are now become upgrading to healthcare you know hostels and the small hotels are becoming healthcare now so what happens to electrical um, uh, system that already installed so they are going to talk about it and uh, followed by we have another uh, vertical uh, talking about automated parking in limited spaces so it's going to be on uh, 11 june and again firemen left on 18 so we have three webinar in the month of june 
and uh, I'm going to, I'll give this floor to our uh, president, Mr. V. Suresh, and the entire uh, panelist you see on the screen, over to our uh, president for to take up the question and answer session. We are thank, late. Th we have thank 15 you. minutes to cover, sir. Yes, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic. And thank you very much to all the distinguished speakers, uh, Sandeep Shikreji, Tag Matthew, Vincent Pinto, as well as Ashish Dakan. What wonderful time we had over the last, we started at four o'clock. We have time over and is there, but it is worth it, really worth it. And you've got another 15 more minutes for the q and A. I got about 16 odd questions which has come over there in the, in the last uh, 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 presentation time period. What I'll go through is really quickly go through it. Let the replays also come at the same speed at which my questions are being raised. I think the first is going to be Sandeep Shikre. Udra Kamakar would like to know about the regenerative drive system. You mentioned very briefly on that. Would you like to open up very briefly on that? Re regenerative drive system. Unmute. Sandeep, are you there? Sandeep, you to unmute. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, so would you like I, very I, briefly talk on that? Absolutely. I'll keep it very brief because... What is that? Re yeah. Yeah. So uh, the regen uh, elevators are the... Uh, are the new uh, technology in the elevators, whereby the thought is that the elevators, while they're moving up and down, they have a regenerating process and that helps to conserve the energy. This is a very subjective issue. I would request the gentleman who has asked this question to refer to all those documents and all those informations. And offline, we can send him a complete folder on the regen technology of our elevators. But it's it's something which is very user-friendly. It's quite common in current scenario. So it also helps you consume, conserve the energy up to 30%. Thank you, Sandeep. The question was from Rudra Karmaka. Okay, so that you know the name uh, on that. So now coming to TAC has got a large list of questions coming on that. And the first one is for Venkataya. Venkataya has indicated that 25 seconds and 35 seconds have been indicated for quality of uh, service. Tack, the question that Venkat would like to find out, are there any high-rise buildings close to 25 seconds waiting period during peak hours in India, in any building? Or is that limit that is put over there uh, an un uh, unreachable level? Or would you like to moderate that particular time period? Tack. Uh, it is, it is uh, achievable. Uh, our commercial buildings are all, mostly are below 25 seconds. Few are below 35 seconds. And uh, trust me, if uh, the developer doesn't listen to what we have to say, we walk away from a project. Because uh, if we do it at about more than 35 seconds, what yeah. effectively happens is during lunchtime, it can yeah. get into uh, four, five, six minutes in terms of average waiting time. So you, yeah. cannot, you cannot destroy the building by yeah. a, a, I mean, sort of a, of, a, of a viewpoint at an early say and say, no, we cannot achieve it. And so let's not do it. Yeah. It's a worldwide norm. It's a norm that is required in India. Before long, Wonderful. tenants will walk away. If yeah. you do not have uh, good average waiting times. And you had a sense of pride in saying that what is in the NBC 2016 is as good as the world that's uh, over there. Next, coming from Rajiv Mida. Rajiv Mida would like to know about the single floor transit time. A little more opening you may like to do on that. Yeah, the, the single. And especially that you can add along with that the average interval time also, calculating the average interval time. Yeah, the average interval time calculated, I think I had covered it. Uh, the I average transit time also I've covered it in the presentation. Yeah. So probably I think that is uh, I mean probably uh, maybe before that. Yeah, I INT had, and AWT. INT and AWT you covered in detail. Yeah, I covered it in detail. So I think it's probably before the before that particular slide came in. Okay. So let us get on to uh Kaustip Shivade. Kaustip Shivade say is time to destination 60 second is an average or maximum? Average. Average. So nowadays, social distancing scenario is selling that because of that, in the lift itself, 10 oblique 12 passengers capacity, would you like to make it a larger one to deal with the COVID situation? Uh, 21? Again, I covered that. If your building yeah. is adequately elevated in the first instant, COVID yeah. or no COVID, you do not have a problem. If it is not adequately elevated, I mean, you yeah. do what you want to do, you'll have a problem. No, but if social distancing, you, you, the density of no, so, 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 so that, that's the, the point that I had indicated. So if the building is adequately elevated, and suppose uh, instead of 80% average car loading, we start uh, doing 50% ca car loading. Okay. Okay, okay got so it. We do 50% car, car loading, and assuming that the building population doesn't change, which is not the case, uh, you're okay. okay. 
But okay. if you do not, if you do not have it adequately elevated in the first instant, yeah, you are doomed. Okay, I got that. So Vishwas Tempe feels that now that a lot of metro network has come, where bringing people in a hurry, in a big uh, surge of people coming into all all the building, do you think the special measures required for the uh, elevated traffic analysis for commercial building located close to metro stations? Absolutely. A very interesting question. Ab absolutely, and uh, the National Building Code also does look at that uh, scenario. And in my presentation also, I did mention that if it is near a metro. Your minimum average, uh, your handling capacity has to be a minimum of 12 percent. Minimum. Minimum. Okay, so the answer is geographical there. Geographical is very important. So, so Vishwas, you got an answer on that. Prakash would like to ask uh, two questions on the very interesting one. As per the NBC, uh, do we calculate the occupant load based on gross area, built-up area, FAR, carpet area? So. It's just trying to find out the number of yeah. population. So, uh, I mean, I mean, rather than go through the whole thing, I mean, I'll put it across. Uh, yeah. Paragraph four point two point two two of yeah. Part Eight, Section Five A, makes it very clear that for elevators, it is net usable area. Net usable not, area. Not what you would use for HVAC, or not for what you would use for yeah. structures. With absolute clarity. Yeah, 4.2.2 of part 8, uh, section 5A. You got the answer. Dr. Ranchuri uh, has liked your presentation uh, uh, very well. Of course, that's a compliment thing. Uh, he's talking yeah. home elevators are also getting increasingly common in a, in a large way. And therefore, in addition to uh, issues like uh, full height, light rays, M Emergency battery system, etc., floor leveling accuracy. What other additional safety features would be required? And does is the code cover it, or would you like to cover something more as cautions? Okay, uh, a home lift is covered by standards. So, additional by safety IS 14665, oh, yeah. and it is covered by uh -huh. IS uh, 15259. All the safety norms uh -huh. are covered in it, very clear and very detailed. And which are referred in NBC, and which are referred, referred in, in NBC, NBC part yeah. of. NBC. So there you are, uh, Anshuri said that's already covered there. So we need uh, would like to uh, have information. I mean, do you already have answered that particular thing earlier between uh, INT and AWT. So he says AWT is more used than INT for quality of service. Uh, is it a better way? Uh, is it better way of doing PTA? Uh, you, you start with uh, interval handling capacity, establish it as per the norms of National Building Code, then you go to check what your average waiting time is. So okay. uh, it is not either or, it is both. Both have it's to be both. taken into account. Okay. And he, he has got a, a, a follow follow up question on that. What needs to be in the VTA if there are cafeteria coming on intermediate flows? That's where surge goes out and surge comes in. Uh, I, I think he's talking about the lunchtime particularly. Uh, maybe yeah. is it cafeteria? That's yeah. the, another question yeah. coming on lunch yeah. later. So, so that, that's a that, that, that's a difficult uh, uh, situation, and that's yeah. a nightmare for any uh, elevatoring uh, consultant or any elevatoring solution. Yeah, we cannot design for a worst case scenario of a cafeteria. Okay. What we can design is for the morning up peak. Yeah. And that is the reason why we always suggest that have the cafeteria on a lower floor. And okay. not on the upper floor or not in between, because you the moment you have a thing, you have multiple uh, complications that are added on. Okay. So cafeteria, okay. have it on a lower floor, or have or uh, you know if you're going to provide on a higher floor, you will need to provide for more elevator. Uh, uh, or put the differential uh, timing also to be put for use of cafeteria. Many people do that also. Yeah, okay. I mean, also. In, in fact, one of the things that I have been working on, if an automation scenario also is one of the issues that happen. I'll take a little time here. One yeah. of the issues that happens is that people go to the cafeteria without knowing whether there is seating space or not. Huh. So what I'm suggesting, what I've been recommending to buildings, who, uh, people who have uh, cafeterias on other floors, is that ensure that on every floor, yeah. uh, people know the availability of uh, seating space. So huh. they come to the lobby, before they take the elevator to the cafeteria, they know. So it's just a, it's a very simple, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Ashish Dakar would be able to come up with a good solution where yeah, I think at any point of time. There are good questions for him also coming <laughs> on that. In yeah. fact, a related question which uh, Rishikesh Bhagat, Bhagwat is asking on residential building, what shall be the peak time to be considered residential building? Uh, shall that be at afternoon for three-way traffic or uh, uh, you take uh, during the lunch time? What should be done? Uh, you, or do you take a 50% of the population load for residential during that time? Residential building. Uh, and have you changed again for building. holidays, isn't it? No, res residential building, uh, uh, it is, I mean, 
if you if you were to look in Europe, it's in the yeah. afternoon. The peak is in the afternoon. But if you look in in India, it is in the morning. Morning. The morning is oh. a, is the morning when you have office and school going kids together. So yeah, yeah. for the for the for the purpose of populations, uh, let's not mess around with the population. There is a population assumption that has been given in the National Building Code. Yes. And do, do not reduce the population to fifty percent or thirty percent. The reason why we have an eight percent handling capacity, a lower handling capacity, yes, is because we know that everybody is not traveling. So if you reduce the population, yeah, and then work with a lower handling capacity, you've got a double whammy. You can't, you should not do that. Work yeah, with yeah. the total population. And then take on the lower handling capacity that has been recommended for residential buildings. Of course, Jatin Shah's question is very similar, but not for residential building. What he's asking to you, Matthew, particular, is a queuing during the lunch period, which of course you did say that you will have with normally the one hour duration period. Uh, analysis, when you do that, would it be a nightmare issue or has NBC not, he feels NBC has not covered it. So do you think you would like to open out for such situations? Yes, yes. You also uh, said that 25 seconds is not for the lunch period. You told me earlier. Uh, yeah. lunch, lunch is a nightmare. We yeah. cannot really uh, design a building for uh, lunch because uh, the pattern of lunch is something that is very difficult to uh, predict. Hmm. However, again, uh, this is again something that's been done uh, through uh, time that if uh. you plan for 25 seconds or lower yeah. morning up peak, your lunch uh. should not deteriorate to more than one minute. One minute. You said however, sometimes it can be. Yeah, however, sometimes even two minutes it can be. Yeah, however, minutes. if you have your morning up peak is at one minute and two minutes, lunch peak you'll go into four and five and six minutes, and then all yeah. chaos chaos okay. uh, happens. Good. Uh, but then again, uh, just on this particular thing, on that lunch thing, it is essential yeah. that we locate the cafeteria not from the looks and the form and the convenience perspective, but from the perspective of what will happen to the elevators. Okay. It's also essential that we plan it such that people know whether they need to go to the cafeteria, whether it is full, whether there's a seating space, etc. It's, it's a Excuse fairly me. complex uh, thing. Yeah. Which... Yeah. <coughs> Another related question which comes over is especially taller buildings coming over there, zoning to be done. Especially, you don't make all the lifts. For example, the case, take the case of Raghu and Anita that you showed over there. The Anita had to go for a higher floor above. So why can't she get into those lifts of zoning up to zero to 10, it won't stop. It will only go beyond that. And who can take the other one? So zoning is a question coming. Would you like to open up? You didn't open out on that. Yeah. Uh, zoning for a taller building, zoning is the only way to go about it. You should not do it in any other fashion. For instance, even, even to address uh, Venkat's uh, question on it, you know, larger floor plate. Does it yeah. make sense to have all the elevators go uh, uh, to all the places? Uh, I, I normally would not want to mention a building, but the one building that I would like to do is talk about is TCS. Hmm. So TCS has a huge floor plate and they have a population of about, uh, uh, on a peak population is about 8,000 people. Uh -huh. And the building is uh, 15 floors, 15, 16 floors. Yeah, yeah. So normal circumstances, you would want to have all the elevators going everywhere. Yeah. But we have well, zoned it and broken good. up the building into three, three, three uh, zones. floors. Seven floors, one, maximum seven floors up to seven and beyond eight and above, something like so, that. So, so that's, that's a good question which has yeah. come. Okay. So zoning is crucial. But again, yeah. it's, a, it's a very complex way of doing it to find out how it helps. Yeah. And yeah. of course, and, uh, it's a scalable area because if you if you locate the machine room in between, you've got scalable area about your hoist doesn't need to go up. Okay. There is another question which has uh, come in respect of hospital lifts more so in the context of the COVID uh, component in respect of the hospital lifts, your service lifts, as well as those to be used by the patients and the staff visitors. Uh, would you like to have some special consideration? You didn't open out on that segment. Would you like to say a few words on yes. hospitals? Because there you are, the requirement of the hospital lift, you require the service lift, service lift you mentioned also, and also for the uh, visitors and staff and the yes. care. So uh, again, uh, the problem when it comes to hospitals is uh, probably 99% of the hospitals in the country today do not have a design basis for elevators. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So okay. when we when we do this hospital, I mean, and uh, when we do a we have to do an analysis for a hospital, what yeah. we assume, yeah, or what the calculation that would need need to be done is yeah. not an up peak or scenario like that. The calculation okay. that would need to be done is for yeah. an emergency evacuation situation for as yeah. to how many beds. Yeah. Which means it's only one bed at a time has to be taken yeah. down. Your capacity yeah. has to be for that. Okay. Now, if that is taken care of. Yeah. You don't have a problem. You don't have a problem yeah. in any situation. The, the related, a related question on this particular thing, emergency medical service lifts, uh, lifts for EMS, are there separately in addition to the normal hospital bed lifts? Are there some hospitals having that particular emergency medical service moment lifts? Are you aware? 
uh, emergency medical services which of course the... NBC has provided a very briefly EMS. So, so what, what ends up happening is there is a provision in NBC. So what happens is an emergency service, emergency medical service thing is where there is a priority call. Okay. And that elevator is allotted. So suppose suppose there's a situation yeah. where a uh, patient right. needs to be taken to the ICU or maybe taken to the operation theater fast. Like this, in a fast time. Okay. Yeah. So then there's a priority override switch whether the elevator is made available. Thank but you. Again, Thank in you. all this, again, all this, what happens is there has to be a design basis for how you're providing elevators. Right, sir. Right, I got it, sir. Just put in something. I got it, sir. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a related question following that from Deepak Monga. Deepak has asked on that. Uh, why are we not at all speaking about fire evacuation? Of course, you're going to talk on fire lifts coming in the next week, but you are, there's a general feeling in case of fire, don't use lifts. But that is slowly undergoing a change, especially when you have taller buildings of 50, 60 and all that. Would you like to talk a little on that fire evacuation? That's again a one-hour one session. My, my half a minute. Half a my, minute. My, no, my, my suggestion is attend the session on June uh, 18th, I think is when, uh, I think, please attend the session on June 18th because this fireman's lift is yeah, I got, I got not that. something that can be handled. I got that, minute. I got that. Because I know you, you have said it will <clears> undergo a change in the latest NBC for yeah. providing that. Uh, this was Deepak Monga. Deepak, when you have that, then you have got Mohit Gupta has asked a very interesting question. Possibly it's an area where you could start with and later on uh, Ashish Dakan can uh, add a little. We are talking futuristic products for tall buildings over there. And the biggest... Uh, Thing is use of technology in a large way. Of course, large number of technology issues on temperature screening, access control, face detection, as well as uh, no touch uh, things and cameras taking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm trying to integrate this question. Maybe initially you can open out later on. Ashish I, 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 I think I think you need to let Vincent also. I think Vincent, please jump yeah, in and give your Vincent viewpoint. Is getting too, no, Vincent getting. Uh, just logged out because he just messaged me that uh, he has another meeting at. Yeah, he had a meeting at six, but okay. he waited. So, but uh, he said he will uh, take the questions offline and uh, post it. Okay. Okay. So just so talk about. We'll, we'll send across. Maybe you yeah. could answer initially and followed by Ashish Dakinson. Technology. Okay. So, latest technology. Te technology is all all very good, and you know I, we need IoT. We need uh, all the technology that is AI, coming. Yeah. However. What needs to be re remembered is it cannot be a substitute for your fundamentals. Okay. So if it is okay. IoT, it cannot be a substitute for service or maintenance, ah. but it has to be something that augments service and maintenance. Complement. Okay. It okay. cannot be something which substitutes says, or oh, we can reduce the number of elevators by technology. Sorry, it doesn't okay. work that way. And okay. my, my, my worry is that it is being projected as a substitute. For what is our, what are the fundamentals? Let us hear from Ashish Dakin also. That. Maybe he also means complementing. If I got it right, not substitution. Ashish Dakin sir, it's not substitute, but you know it can facilitate. It can be yeah. enhanced. You know, can be taken care more carefully, and how the integration of different technology can enhance existing uh, you know challenges or functions of. Uh, so technology can surely play a very very important role. Uh, so it can be a complementary function. Can play a very uh, important role. Like uh, okay, okay, okay. So uh, maybe yeah, the next that's question like, that's you the, have to place a little Yeah. Like what it, example, uh, you, place you want to open up some, something more, Ashish? You want to say something more? Uh, recognition and uh, Ashish ji, Ashish ji, your signal is very weak. Hai. Uh, internet is hai. quite anyway, very I, I, I got the reply. Yeah. Possibly anticipating this reply from back as well as uh, 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 from Ashish Dakan, Satish Ayangar, uh, our treasurer and founding member wants integration with IBMs for all parameters difficult due to compatibility issues with lift manufacturers. How does the lift association plan to address this? There's different floor opening doors in different directions that have effect on NBC requirements and lift corridor pressurization. So he's trying to put part four of the NBC along with part eight section on pressurization and the opening, etc. Would you like to uh, uh, attempt the response on that? What yeah, Satish I, wants? I, I'll start with the first, whether it is about uh, BMS. Yeah. Uh, there are powerful elevator management systems that uh, are available. Hmm. However, with that powerful thing, scenario, uh, what I see as a situation is it, it is, it is a, it has to be handled with only by authorized people. Yeah. Many okay. of the projects that we have, we have very uh, specialized uh, elevator management systems in place. Uh -huh. Now, connecting it to a general BMS is something that I, I look at with a lot of trepidation. 
unless yeah, yeah. it is just basic information getting it out yeah. with a with a, with a uh, total bms system has its own uh, problems okay so, uh, i mean beyond the potential free contacts and some of the few information that should bms should collect <clears throat> any further information should be a standalone independent system of of the regular bms and it is available and the list manufacturer was also fully getting geared to this particular thing but they, they have it it's, it's been available for more than 15 uh, 15 okay years. so uh, uh, Satish, that worry is, you don't worry on that. You can take the second part of your question. You're worried on pressurization issue that comes over there. And how do you deal with that? Yeah. Uh, uh, pres because pressurization he's again also is asked, NBC mandates lift shaft pressurization in very tall buildings. So let's take no, it no, together. No, so sorry, sorry. NBC does not mandate pressurization for the hoistway. It mandates pressurization for the hoistway if a lift lobby cannot be provided. I mean, okay. uh, this this is this is this is uh, something that I have been trying to clarify. Satish is a no. is a clarification. Satish, you are not there to hear. But I, anyway, I think it's a good point. What is once the lift lobby is already pressurized, you don't have to do the uh, shaft. That's what you said. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and, and check check part part uh, part four. It's very okay. clear about that. Possibly on 18th you can open out yeah. because that's all on the fire lift you are talking. You can open out on that. Prakash Shegle wants to, again, he doesn't leave, he's one of the many questions he's asked, uh, whether ARD works for elevators for 50% and above flows and no stops up to 50% for lower flows. Take an example, 25 floor commercial I think you answered that. You said the zoning component, uh, uh, <coughs> yeah. you know, non-stop up to certain, you already answered that. He's put a figure, 50% doesn't uh, floor, that up to 12 flows, it doesn't stop, it goes beyond 12. It doesn't, it can be even seven flows, as you said. It can, it, yeah. it can change. So That's we will take only two more questions. So we'll take two more questions. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, uh, and uh, and the other question we'll uh, take across. Uh, next question that we have is uh, coming from uh, Atul Joshi. Which online lift OEM university we can follow for leaning elevator science for learning elevator science? Um, right. th th Which online lift OEM OEM university? I think. No, there, there is there is no OEM university as uh, as such. Uh, the Northampton in UK does give a, a thing on, on this. There are a lot of resources that is available online uh, for, let me make it very clear, for theoretical knowledge. But uh, recognize okay. that elevators, it's essential that you temper it with practical knowledge. You not go with just... Okay. Uh, so it's a, it's a both combination. Predominantly practical design orientation installation. As you, you spend a lot of things on the design stage, installation safety, etc. There is one question which has come, which is unanswered, uh, which I kept towards the end there. How do you take care of the seamless integration required when technologies are to be used? Would you, would uh, Ashish Dakan try to take that? Uh, is it possible to do that when you have so much of new, the technology issues being brought in? Can you do a seamless integration along with the lift uh, people? Is it an area which you normally sit together across a cup of tea? Ashish ji. Yeah, it is very easy. See, but the, at the end, what is the technology integration? See, the NO or NC inputs or the alarm input signals, you know, which we can just give and the integrations with the uh, code of the lift software or the lift system. Okay. So we can integrate seamlessly, no problem. We uh, can, it's doable. What level of deep integration is required? Okay. Also. I think Sandeep wants to comment on that. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Sandeep, please chip in. Yeah. So this Sandeep, is. Sandeep, please very, chip in. Very, yeah. So this is, I will just quickly address this because this is a very important question. Uh, as uh, Vincent explained, vertical transportation is not only vertical, but it's also a transit uh, management. So imagine a gated community of a high density, high rise residential building where yes. a person comes. So when he comes at the entrance, the main boom barrier, you know, where the boom barrier opens up with his smartphone compatibility or RFID compatibility. Now the system has recognized that Mr. Ashish has come. And they know that the Ashish has his parking on a P4. So by the time he goes to the podium four level, the flat barrier of podium four is open. And then he goes and parks his car. The minute he parks his car, the occupation sensor recognizes that he has arrived at his parking. Yeah. And the elevator is coming and stopping for him at P4 level. And okay. he smoothly goes into the elevator. So this is a transit management. It just works like a James Bond. So you don't have anything. Wherever you don't have to press anything, it all identifies because high density, high rise premises like Ashish ji said, uh, has an artificial intelligence that profiles and recognizes yeah. the people and their movement pattern. Yeah. That's how the future is. That's a smart future, which uh, is becoming very popular nowadays. Uh, uh, again, one more area, of course, didn't open out. I'm sure it'll be done. No touch, 
uh, I mean, without everything, identification of the people, uh, uh, camera identification, opening of the doors, less touch of less of touch related aspect to deal with that. Uh, me, I know it's known, but then would Ashish like to open a word on that? See, same like what uh, uh, just now uh, Sandeep Ji has explained, you know, AI yeah, I can play a very major role like, okay. you know, identifying the person's faces and okay. then entering to the lift or, you know, can manage okay. uh, the distribution, etc. Surely can integration can play a role, including touch Thank you. experience. Thank you. The last question, that I have some more, but I've just selected a few of them. The last question which I want to say is actually from uh, Gurunath Prabhu, very important question. So after all the installation is over, is most important who for the pudding is in the eating? How is the whole performance of the lift installation? So the whole issue of assets and facility management, the maintenance of the lift becomes an important one. NBC has not only part eight, section five, but also part 12 on assets and facility management on escalators, which has got a whole new chapter covered on that. So his question is that, please indicate the load test for elevators on site after installation, because you talked of load, whatever it is, you take only 80% or lesser than that particular thing. So how do you really carry out the load test on a elevator after installation is a question number one. A subsequent question will come to you in a minute. Back. Okay. Yeah, uh, so load testing, you get test weights, yeah, and that's so, uh, 68 after. kilogram multiplied by so many people. Are, so that's yeah. the no, it, uh, I mean, overload. I mean, the, your overload device is 115 percent, your oh, brake is at 125 percent, your okay. counter needs to be checked for that. So, there are multiple things, and it is test weights, it, it's not anything which is complicated, but you need to physically put test weights in the car to check. Okay, the last one is the protocol in respect of needed for the complete maintenance or the but to ensure that. 24 by 7 checks, be the wire, be the, uh, what do you call, strands, whatever, which all go weak. How do you ensure that? And what type of system would you recommend? Uh, AMC with the lift manufacturers or a separate AMC uh, um, asset management company to deal with that? What is the best model that you have? Or is a combination of both? It's so technical and spares are not regularly available. Please go to the OEM only. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll stop with that particular thing as a brief answer. Okay? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to all my distinguished panelists for the sharp, sharp replies I got for the, all the questions that has come over there. I'm sure they're all going to enjoy this particular one. But I'm, as uh, um, uh, Dominic has said, this is not the end of it. This will open up with a series of subtopics will start coming over there. As you said, the next one is going to be on the 18th. We'll build on it. For example, when Ashish Dakar presented the thing in terms of the security one, we never thought the link, umbilical link with the lift installation, but I'm happy that you could come and join with us. I want to thank uh, all the speakers uh, for the thing. I'm sure formally it will be done now in a minute from now. So we're very happy to have uh, uh, not only Sandeep Shikreji, Tak Matthew, as well as Vincent Pinto. Very sorry that you missed him on that. I have two questions for him, I'll, which I'll share with him. And of course, Ashish uh, uh, Duck and Sap, and for your gracious presence and for the way in which you eliminate. And mind you, we are already two hours and 24 minutes on the system. We started on DOT. Thank you very much. I'm signing off. Dominic, take over. Oh, wonderful, sir. You have great talent in everywhere. You have moderated so well. <laughs> I think we should have you every knowledge series as a moderator. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, opening remark, you earned it very well. You are like a, like a running commentary. Very well handled. Uh, the new discovery, a, a new talent discovery. Now, I will not take much time. I will uh, now welcome our uh, General Secretary, Mr. Nasiman, who is quietly listening to the whole session and very patiently and he's one of the veterans from the security industry i'm not going to read i already called him and said i'm sorry i may not read the entire profile but he's also face of the industry in security so over to our general secretary mr narsiman thank you thank you so much uh, mr dominic and a very good evening to everybody uh, mr uh, uh, suresh has almost done uh, partly uh, the job that i was supposed to be doing thank you very much sir um, on behalf of the Management Council of uh, Focus, I thank each one of you for your for joining uh, today's uh, fourth knowledge series webinar on vertical transportation, highlighting on best practices, access management, and related technologies. I am very happy to tell you that today's webinar attracted an overwhelming response with over 650 registrations and over 250 participants at its when it when it was at its peak. We witnessed great knowledge sharing sessions uh, and takeaways from the three distinguished uh, panelists in today's webinar who are, who are stalwarts in the respective fields. 
my sincere thanks to our president mr v suresh for uh, uh, you know attending today's uh, uh, webinar and also moderating the question and answer sessions i would like to thank um, architect uh, sandeep shikre who is also our regional chairman best for his keynote address our thanks to mr tak matthews uh, mr vincent pinto and mr Ash ashish dakan for sharing your wealth of knowledge which gave deep insight on today's webinar related with vertical transportation and factors to be considered for safety and security in the installation usage and operation of the vertical transport system humble thanks to mr kp dominic our chairman event and marketing and also regional chair south for being the ma master of ceremony in today's webinar once again big applause to mrs mamata nagaraj for articulating uh, and organizing today's event last but not the least to all of you for your participation in today's webinar our very special thanks to the sponsor mrs uh, schindler for sponsoring today's event and uh, we deeply appreciate your coming forward and sponsoring today's event the next webinar is being conducted by focus electrical vertical committee headed by mr j n bhavani prasad uh, who is the chairman of uh, this particular committee and uh, also the co chair mr chand daruwala on the topic performance of electrical systems with safety of buildings upgraded for healthcare this is being conducted on friday the 4th of june at 4 pm uh, this is followed by the next uh, webinar which was just announced in today's meeting about the fireman's lift requirement as per ndc guidelines which is which will be conducted on the 18th of june at 4 pm requesting all uh, to join uh, you know the Uh, these two webinars positively and ensure your uh, you know we will ensure that you get all the invitation on time uh, we uh, as a general secretary my humble request to each one of you who have participated in today's event to become members of uh, the focus uh, association and uh, the membership forms are available in our website the details are also available you can please visit our, our website www.ourfocus.co to get more details and there is there is a provision to directly become member through our website so please and please ensure that you know you become members of focus requesting uh, we all of all of you to join as uh, members not only uh, in the in as in the association but take art, active participation in the growth of focus thank you very much once again to everyone and th once again thank you to all the panelists who participated in today's event thank you thank you all thank you thank you very much great, great. thank good. you good night you can sign off sir sandeep yes. that is good your presentation is very good yeah sandeep uh, very well you know uh, very good uh, you got really, it very well really of course that that math